and to is there going to be seasonality with the COVID um, virus. So, so this paper, this is all open access, freely available. Google absolute humidity and the seasonal onset of influenza in the continental United States. And you can look at these images, these plots. So I was just starting explaining them at the end of the last video. I'll just recap. This is the this is for in influenza. So this is for normal flu. The virus transmission drops off significantly as the specific humidity uh, increases. So the grams of kilograms of water um, versus kilograms of air. So that's the amount of water in the air, one percent, two percent, and you can see the drop off of transmission, the percent transmission drops off significantly with humid air. This is the um, survival, um, you know, we can use this, you know, think of ways, you know, can we use this? Can we, if we humidify the air before we breathe it in, um, that should keep the virus from coming in. So maybe we don't need um, masks, we need a little humidifier unit that sits on our face and, and, and gives us very high you know, specific humidities of water, evaporates water, and, uh, you know, so basically, you know, create sauna-like conditions for your face, and that should uh, basically re greatly reduce the, the transmission, for example. This is the influenza virus. Um, so again, this is the flu, survival, re um, survival versus specific humidity. So it drops off here. The, the survival rate significantly, not only does it not move through the through the uh, air to transmit, but it doesn't survive for very long. And the R0, the spreading factor, um, drops off here also with specific humidity increasing. So this is some data from different states, Arizona, Florida, Illinois, New York, Washington, January to January, specific humidity that's typical, kilograms of water in per kilogram of air. And you can see, you know, the humidity um, the, the, the numbers always, always go up in the summer here, and this would thus decrease the percent transmission. This is for the common uh, flu. This is the R0 over through the year, so we've got 2.5 in the winter, and it drops down to about 1.3, 1.4 in the summer. So if COVID behaves this way, there will be a seasonality effect. We don't know that um, yet. So, you know, we're 2.5 right now. Social distancing can bring us down to maybe 2, 1.5, whatever. And then as the warming temperature comes, it can drop us below the 1 threshold. And that would mean that the virus would, would be halted. You know, so we can hope that this thing is seasonal. This is the average. Um, this is an R factor um, for day relative to offset. Um, okay, um, this is a modeled modeled uh, depiction of how the R value changes. But, you know, this is this is the key, the key plot, I would say, this one and this one. Okay, so that's in this paper. And then there's lots of other data, but that's the key finding. Okay, this is some stuff uh, showing the, um, these are the uh, simulations showing the number of cases, the mortality per 100,000 people you know, high in the cold months, drops off in the summer. This is for Florida, for Illinois, New York, Washington, and the it's strongly correlated to the uh, humidity. Okay, lots of tables and other da data, but th those are the key findings from that paper. Um, there's another paper. This one is the role of absolute humidity on transmission rates for the COVID-19 outbreak. Okay, um, so it looks at basically China. I'll just get to the plots and the data. So it looks at various, it looks at the temperature and humidity in different parts of China, and it looks at the spread of the virus in China. And this is the, some of the results. This is reproductive number. Okay, so you know, twos here, we think it's about 2.5 for the coronavirus, but this is the reproductive number in different cities plotted against the absolute humidity. You know, it seems that higher absolute humidity, you know, doesn't really have too much of an effect. I mean, if the spreading number of particles being spread is too high, it can overwhelm 
these other things. There's some maps here. So this is basically the um, conclusion. This is the absolute humidity in each provincial capital in China versus the, the R numbers estimated. The size of color of each pin is cumulative cases per province. So the bigger the circle, the higher the number of cases. The color is the reproductive number, the R0. So the yellow regions, the R0 is low, le you know, less than or equal to 1.06. It's greater, less than or equal to 3.88 in the red regions. These are the absolute humidity numbers. Absolute humidity is much higher here and dropping off here, but you still get the red regions throughout. So it doesn't look like, you know, it looks like the spreading was so powerful that it, you know, and so quick from people that the, even though the, um, the humidity conditions would have suggested less spread, you can't really see that here from the data within China. Now we'll go to this paper here, and this is a key paper. Just definitely have a look at this. So Google temperature, humidity, and latitude analysis to predict potent potential spread and seasonality for, for COVID-19. Okay, so in this paper, basically they did, um, they got the weather data, um, you know, around the planet, and they looked at the spreading around the planet, and they got an interesting um, result that to date, you know, and this was to um, March 10th or something. This was less than a week ago. The coronavirus caused by SARS coronavirus 2 has established um, significant community spread in cities and regions along a narrow east-west distribution, roughly along the 30 to 50 degree north latitude corridor at consistently similar weather patterns consisting of average temperatures of 5 to 11 Celsius combined with low specific, which it would be 3 to 6 grams of water per kilogram of air, um, low specific humidity, and low absolute humidity, which would be 4 to 7 grams per cubic meter of air. Okay, there's been a significant, a lack of significant community establishment in expected locations that are based only on population proximity and extensive population interaction through travel. Okay, and I'll explain, explain that. So, so, this, um, so the interpretation from this paper is that the distribution, distribution of significant community outbreaks along restricted latitude, temperature, and humidity are consistent with the behavior of a seasonal respiratory virus. Okay, so then they took that information and they said, well, what regions would be worse in the next little while if this is the case? And they had a look at that. So they made some sort of predictions on that. But let's have a look at the results, okay? So we'll go to the map here. So this is the two meter air temperature. This is for November, December, January, February, March, 2019. The average, this is the European uh, Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Okay, and what we see here is these are the areas where there's strong outbreaks. Okay, um, and they're following this band. See this yellow band here, which goes across yellow to green, yellow to green band. All of these regions seem to lie in that band. Okay, so the black circles, like I said, are countries with significant community transmission. Okay, and that means transmission that's not directly tied to somebody who's traveling. Okay, um, and it seems to follow in these temperature bands and the yellows here, you know, um, yellows about 15, the greens, the light greens about 10 degrees. Okay, so it follows in these, you know, just north of the, the yellow band and the light green bands is where all of these regions lie. You know, interesting. You know, is it, uh, there's a correlation there. Is there a causation? Okay, looking at, this is the average two meter temperature for January, February, 2020. So the, um, the bands here, so the white circles are countries with significant transmission. The red lines are temperatures between five and 11 Celsius. Okay, so this is the five Celsius line. This is the 11 Celsius line, and that's a band in the Southern Hemisphere, mostly over the ocean. It does come up to the 
the, the tip of South America. And here is the 11 band and the 5 band in the northern hemisphere. And you see all of these outbreak regions are, seem to be within that band. Okay, um, this, is, uh, this would indicate that uh, maybe there's some seasonality component. So the spreading, what it would mean is that the R0 seems to be larger in these regions. Okay, so social distancing cuts the R0 in all regions, but it looks like maybe there's a, a temperature dependence on the, the R0. So this is very significant. This is the humidity now, the average specific humidity up here, and these are the regions this is the average temperature, so you know if we're in the 5 to 11 degree band, I mean, these are the regions here that are the worst, and these are other regions, um, and this is a specific humidity. So it does spread in other regions, but maybe it doesn't spread so, so fast. Um, this is the 2 meter temperature for March and April now. So if you make a projection, um, and the band, this 5 to 11 degree band, is in the darker, is in the green here, the uh, green in the southern hemisphere, hitting the tip of South America, and it's also in these other regions. So you can see, you know, what regions, what if your cities in those regions might be more severely affected if there's a seasonal effect. And then there's some tables, and there's more. I think those are the key. Those are the key findings. Um, so what we've got is we've got um, we've got we've we've shown if there is a seasonal effect, and as we go into you know from March into April, there could be more of these significant spreading in cities that lie within these bands. That's what this study it, it's showing, um, and this is what we have uh, so far with the five to eleven degree band. Okay, so and this this one here. Okay, so very, very interesting study might give us some, you know, it does give us some insight into perhaps some seasonality, but it remains to be seen. You know, it's just one study, but it's some interesting results. And I just want to point out, this is a very good article in the conversation, how changes brought on by coronavirus could help tackle climate change. Okay, and it talks about, you know, the link between economic activity and global CO2 emissions and it makes projections um, that uh, you know the emissions are likely to, to drop for 2020, but it doesn't say for for how much. Um, you know, in China for two weeks, it dropped production 25 percent, cleaned up the air over China. China's ramping up, but the airline industry is shuttering down. So I'll have to do some separate um, analysis of this. But according to this study. Um, you know, they say under the worst case forecast, OECD forecast, the global economy could grow as little as 1.5%. I don't see how, how, like these numbers seem absurd. I don't know what assumptions they make, how long the shutdown would be, but you know, it seems like, it seems ridiculous to me that we could achieve that. And then, uh, you know, if this happened though, it would lead, you know, 1.5% uh, growth, it would lead to a 1.2% decline in CO2 emissions in 2020. We'll, we'll see. I think these numbers are like super conservative and I would, I would discount them. I think they'll be a lot higher. Okay, so it talks about all of the, but it's, you know, it's worth reading. It's worth getting um, their viewpoint on it. So um, what I've done in the, this video in the last two is I talked about the power of pandemic, some of the power to change civilizations. I talked about the his history going back in the last 2,000 years of pandemics and how many people um, they were, were, uh, were, were the death toll in these pandemics, related it to global world population here. So you can see and an, get an idea. So of course the, uh, you know, the plague uh, here, the, the, the bubonic plague took out about half of the world, if you believe those, the, the numbers here, both here and, and the uh, 200 million number here. Of course, here's the John Hopkins site of what's happening today. Um, and I talked about a number of different papers, um, you know, about looking at the seasonality um, of the uh, virus, you know, calendar of epidemics, trying to figure out is there going to be seasonality, you know, China numbers, is there going to be seasonality 
Um, are we going to see seasonality? It remains to be seen, but it's food for thought. Thank you for listening.